I want to talk about some recent work that I've been conducting over the last years, looking at these interesting microbial populations from hot springs and how they might uh, give us a little bit of a better idea of the early evolution of sulfate reducers. So microbial dissimilatory sulfate reduction is an incredibly important process on contemporary Earth. It has the, uh, the function of coupling both sulfur and carbon biogeochemical cycling on Earth. In fact, over 11 teramoles of sulfate are estimated to be uh, reduced by microbial dissimilatory sulfate reduction annually. And via the concerted oxidation of organic carbon in, in sediments, up to about 30% estimated of the organic uh, carbon that's delivered to the seafloor is actually oxidized uh, via the sulfate reduction. It has the effect of, uh, of being a very important process on contemporary Earth. And we have a good idea that this uh, microbial metabolism has been uh, an important part of, of life since very early on through lots of work, uh, particularly through um, analysis and investigation of the dresser formation in Western Australia. We've heard several great talks that have highlighted some of the, uh, the great finds coming from this area. We know that microbial sulfate reducers have likely been around since about 3.5 billion years ago uh, via uh, biotic uh, sulfur fractionation of sulfides and barides. Now, interestingly, we also have a good idea that sulfate concentrations in oceans have changed dramatically uh, since the onset of uh, these sulfur isotope fractionations. And in fact, sulfur, sulfate concentrations in oceans have increased orders of magnitude since the early Archean, when we think microbial sulfate reducers uh, would have evolved. And so this has led to a, a bit of an apparent uh, paradox uh, in that we have the origination or presumed origination of microbial sulfate reducers in the early Archean, but not very much sulfate around. And the sulfate that was present is thought to be primarily derived from the photolysis of atmospheric sulfur dioxide uh, to sulfate that's then uh, rained out into oceans. And so this has led to several different hypotheses in order to try to reconcile uh, the origin of uh, sulfate and sulfite reducing organisms, which I'll refer to as SRO for the rest of the talk, um, with these low concentrations of sulfate. And, and these various hypotheses have different merits. And uh, rather than go into the various merits of all these different hypotheses during this talk, what I would like to do is try to provide an alternative uh, hypothesis, an alternative framework of thinking about the early evolution of sulfate reducers. And that is looking at uh, environments uh, that, are, that were sulfur rich, uh, so continental uh, hydrothermal springs. So you can see from these uh, couple of pictures that they're uh, indeed very sulfur rich, as you can uh, note from the precipitated uh, elemental sulfur there. And these springs have the uh, effect of concentrating sulfate. So we can get very high levels of sulfate, uh, particularly in acidic pH from the tens of millimolar to hundreds of millimolar concentrations. So this is some data from collaborator Everett Shock over several hundred different hot springs uh, and others, uh, showing that you know, these springs have uh, the ability to concentrate sulfate at very high levels. In addition, uh, as Martin Cronen Van Cronendonk uh, laid out in a really nice talk earlier this week at his plenary uh, session uh, on Wednesday, this earliest isotopic evidence for this SRO activity from the dresser formation uh, is what we use to sort of infer their early evolution. But we now know through work uh, through uh, Martin's lab and, and others that this area of the formation appears to have been associated with uh, hydrothermal spring environments. In a paper uh, that this figure is taken from by Jokic et al. just a couple years ago, it shows a very nice schematic of what a, a theorized sort of hydrothermal spring environment around the dresser formation might have been. So this prompts the question then, could these uh, continental hydrothermal systems have promoted the origins of SRO? And on top of that, if so, did uh, sulfate or perhaps a less oxidized sulfur oxyanion like sulfite have supported these early SRO organisms? And so I became interested uh, in, this, in this area uh, via some previous analysis that I had done of this spring. It's MV2 spring in Yellowstone National Park. It's a moderately acidic spring, a uh, pH of about 3 to 5, depending on when you sample it, uh, moderate temperatures of 50 to 70 degrees Celsius, uh, roughly. And it sits in an area with some of the highest levels of gas efflux in Yellowstone. And so I had conducted some metagenomic analysis of the spring in order to identify how individual microbial populations are interacting with each other at the level of sulfur and carbon. And what we found was this uh, new group of SRO here that had not been previously identified using these uh, metagenomic reconstructions of genomes, or MAGs. Uh, and in fact, these organisms appear to be a potentially a new order or a new class level of the Yuri Archaeota, uh, which I refer to for the rest of this talk as the Yuri SRO, distantly related to other organisms from deep sea hydrothermal vents. 
So one of the ways we can uh, get an idea about what these organisms are doing is by looking for key genes involved in metabolism, like uh, uh, Jan was talking about just a second ago. And the dissimilatory sulfite reductase uh, enzyme is one of the key genes for sulfate reduction. But it's important to note that it's actually involved in sulfite reduction, not sulfate uh, reduction per se. It, as this, oops, sorry, I went ahead just a little bit there. So as this diagram showing from a paper a few years ago, there's several steps involved in sulfate reduction that includes the activation of sulfate early on, uh, followed by the sulfite reduction uh, via DSRAB. But in fact, the, the proteins that are involved in sulfate activation were absent in these URI SER genomes that we were able to recover from Yellowstone Hot Springs, despite the fact that they're nearly complete genomes, suggesting that they did not have the capacity to activate sulfate, but rather were uh, just reducing sulfite. So these organisms appear to be lacking uh, the capacity to activate sulfate. As I mentioned, they're probably only uh, reducing uh, sulfite. In fact, if we take uh, sediments from MV2 spring uh, and we inoculate them with some hydrogen uh, as well as some organic carbon like peptone, as well as different oxidants including sulfite, uh, sulfate, and uh, amendments without uh, anything, we see that we get hydrogen sulfide production only with sulfite, indicating that this capacity is present uh, in these native sediments. So the question that uh, we wanted to, to, to get at is in context of other uh, SRO, how do these organisms uh, inform about uh, the evolution of, of, of SRO in general? And so to do that, we reconstructed the evolutionary history of these uh, DSR-AB enzymes. So what I'm showing here is an unrooted uh, phylogeny of a concatenation of DSR-AB homologs. And so surprisingly, uh, what it found is that these uri SRO uh, branch out very early on uh, in the evolution of SRO. They group with other thermophilic archaea from a different type of archaea, though, Cranarchaeota. In addition to some other oddball uh, uh, DSR-AB uh, homologs, including a second genomic copy from thermophilic morella, which are widely studied as acetogens, as well as some um, DSR homologs from uncultured mags from uh, various environments, including hydrothermal vents, subsurface uh, reservoirs, and peats. And all the other SR, all the DSRAB from other SRO, as well as from sulfur oxidizing bacteria, which use DSR in the reverse direction, including uh, anoxygenic phototrophs, all belong to this group uh, that's much later branching. And as I mentioned, this tree is an unrooted uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, so the presumed origin would be somewhere around this trifurcation point here. But the nice thing about uh, DSR is that you can actually re reciprocally root um, DSR homologs because the DSR-AB subunits are thought to be evolutionarily derived from one another. So uh, it's thought that there was a gene duplication event that led to the, uh, the production of DSR-A or B from the other uh, subunit. And so you can use these to reciprocally root the subunits and get a better handle on the evolutionary trajectory of DSR-AB enzymes. And so I did that. Um, and what I found, again, was that these uh, Morella second genomic copies were, of course, some of the earliest branching. Uh, DSR homologs, but so were these URI SRO DSR homologs, uh, as well as those from the Crenarchaeota and some of these other uncultured mags. Well, the, the uh, triangle shown in orange there is essentially everything else, uh, all the other SRO, which includes all the model organisms, the disulfovibrios, archaeoclobales, uh, et cetera. So taking a closer look at who some of these organisms are to try to infer uh, something about the ecology of these organisms, these deeply branching uh, DSR homologs from Morella are from organisms that don't actually reduce sulfate or sulfite. Uh, nevertheless, they're thermophilic. A lot of these have been isolated from hot springs. And these DSR, as I mentioned earlier, represent a second genomic copy. And so it's unclear what, these function, what the function of these uh, enzymes are at the moment, given that these organisms can't reduce sulfate and sulfite. Uh, nevertheless, these uh, URI SRO, we believe to be sulfite reducers that are present in hot springs. Likewise, for this group of largely Crenarchaeota archaea, uh, it includes both sulfite and sulfate reducers uh, from hot springs as well. And while this other early branching group uh, includes both sulfite and sulfate reducers as well as, uh, or potentially, uh, sorry, these are uncultured organisms, so we, we don't know for sure what they're conducting, but it's possible it could be sulfite or sulfate reduction as well as sulfur oxidation. And again, these are uh, found in hydrothermal vents, sub subsurface aquifers, and peats. And here's everything else. So these results uh, give us an, uh, an implication that 
prevalence of these early branching DSR homologs, largely from thermophilic organisms that are implicated not in sulfate reduction, suggests an early evolution of DSR to catalyze potentially other reactions besides uh, those coupled to sulfate reduction, including uh, simply sulfite redu reduction only in thermophiles. And so this naturally leads to the question of whether or not a sulfite would actually be present in these environments. Um, and so while there has been some evidence that sulfite is present in Yellowstone Hot Springs from some early work by Thomas Brock and others, there's been little data to actually constrain its presence across geochemical gradients. So we wanted to, to, to better understand whether or not uh, sulfite could be something that we would rationally expect to see in these types of environments. Knowing, of course, that sulfite rapidly oxidizes in the presence of oxygen or ferric iron, uh, but otherwise can be stable, so we took a laboratory microcosm approach. Uh, and this is work that an undergrad uh, that I recruited to work on this project, Maria Clara Fernandez, did in a really good set of laboratory studies where we evaluated the stability of sulfite across uh, the temperature range that we see at MV2 spring just to see whether or not uh, sulfite would be stable. And this is under both uh, oxic and anoxic conditions. And as you can see from the graph here, that the amount of sulfite that remains in these microcosms after 24 hours under oxic conditions is essentially zero at higher temperatures. So there's a temperature-dependent effect, effect here in, in addition to the oxygen-dependent effect, uh, while sulfite remained uh, basically stable under anoxic conditions. And we also did this under uh, a, a range of pH as well to see whether or not sulfite uh, would have a pH-dependent uh, stability effect, which uh, uh, Maria found that it did. So at higher pH, we found that sulfite was more stable after 24 hours. So sulfite uh, is likely to be present in hot, hot springs, but its, uh, its presence is likely dependent on the, the availability of oxygen as well as lower temperatures and uh, relatively higher pHs. And so with this information in hand, um, MV2 is actually a pretty geochemically dynamic spring, which gives us an opportunity to evaluate the potential activity of these organisms over a broad geochemical range. So we sampled MV2 over three different years and just determined the presence and potential activity of these organisms uh, using targeted transcriptomics. Um, and so this covers a pH range uh, of a little bit less than this, uh, temperatures of about 55 to 70 degrees Celsius. And what we found is that these Uri SRO were present in all of the samples uh, but their DSR were only transcribed and the pH was higher in the spring. And so what I'm showing here is DSRA transcription levels, at, and these dates are ordered by pH going from lower to higher here. And so we only found that DSRA was transcribed at these higher pH, despite the fact that they were actually present in these lower, uh, the DSRA copies from Uri SRR were also uh, present in these lower pH samples as well. And this seems to be consistent with the, our early results uh, that pH has this, or I'm sorry, uh, sulfite stability has this pH dependent relationship and also the fact that there's a simple speciation processes where we'd expect uh, bisulfite and sulfite to be uh, more prevalent uh, than sulfur dioxide at higher pH. At least it's qualitatively consistent with those two pieces of evidence. Um, so with that, um, if in fact the earliest evidence for SRO, SRO are associated with these sulfitic hydrothermal spring deposits, as uh, some recent evidence has suggested, then it suggests that these early SRO may have actually been thermoacidophilic, which is consistent with a, a lot of other evidence suggesting that early diverging archaeal and bacterial lineages are in fact thermophilic. The phylogenetic analyses that I showed here uh, supports that these early uh, sulfite reducing enzymes are generally from thermophiles and also largely not coupled to sulfate reduction in some of the earliest homologs that we know about. And it's possible that these moderately acidic springs uh, that favor the presence and stability of sulfite are potential environments that could have supported early SRO and these uh, deeper branching sulfite reducers, uh, but certainly uh, lots of further investigation is needed of both these environments and the taxa in order to elucidate whether these organisms and potentially others that we've uh, yet to find are involved exclusively in sulfite reduction or potentially other types of uh, metabolisms. Um, and so with that, uh, there's lots of folks I'd like to thank uh, that have worked on this, but particularly those that are highlighted in red here, as well as funding. Um, and I think I'm a little short on time, but I'd just like to say real quick that there's several positions open for postdocs and grad students in our lab. and so. If you know folks looking for uh, grad student positions or postdoc positions, there's several opportunities here, so feel free to contact myself or Eric Boyd. Um, and with that, I think I might have time for a quick question, but thank you.
Have you tried thiosulfate? Uh, I haven't tried thiosulfate, and the reason that we didn't originally is because thiosulfate has this pH dependent stability as well, and so we, you know, it degrades below pH four essentially. And so when we found these organisms, it was only at below pH four, so it didn't, uh, it wasn't something that was, you know, right off the top of our head. Um, so I, I'm actually working on some microcosms to sort of rework some of uh, the culture dependent uh, parts of the work this summer. And so we have plans to include thiosulfate, um, but of course only at higher pH, because at lower pH it would just degrade to elemental sulfur and sulfite. So 